So, hi everybody. I'm a bit surprised that the, full, the, the room is pretty packed. So, thank you for coming and thank you for having me here. Uh, today, I want to talk about the mutation testing and the way we should, do, we should actually take to, to leave the stone age. So, a few things about myself. Um, I'm an iOS developer by day and uh, in my spare time I'm actually hacking on compilers and this is like basically my hobby and uh, this project actually my hobby itself. So if you're curious you can find me on Twitter and uh, I have two blogs where I write about some low level stuff, LLVM itself and mutation testing also. And especially if you are into software testing and quality of software then I uh, recommend you to Look at the last um, link, the systemundertest.org. Uh, there I and uh, friends of mine, we are writing about different software, how it's tested, and so on and so forth. So it was a shameless plug. Um, yeah, this is the, the outline for today's talk. I will start uh, with the quality of software, then I will talk a bit about the unit testing, then we will uh, move towards uh, mutation testing. Then I want to present the tool that I'm working on, and at the very end, I will try to, to, to present a showcase, uh, like uh, real life usage of this tool. But um, I'm afraid that I will not be able to, to, to give you like some stellar um, examples. Um, but that's going to be interesting, I hope. Yeah, so I do software for about like seven. Uh, yeah, seven years now, I think, and uh, I enjoy it a lot. But one thing that I'm concerned uh, a bit is the fact that software is just like broken. Like essentially everything is broken, like browsers, compilers, operating system, games, just anything. It's full of bugs and it doesn't work and so on and so forth. So we as developers, as computer scientists and engineers, we are trying to put as much as possible efforts in for decades to improve the software somehow. And there are some some ways to do it. So, for instance, uh, just, just today we had uh, a great talk about formal uh, verification of programs. But I don't know much about this topic, but as far as I know, uh, we are not there yet. The tooling is, is great, it, it's improving, uh, but it's quite hard to, to verify C or C++ because of this undefined behavior and so on. So another great uh, approach is fast testing. Um, it, yeah, I think it, it's like here like for, for a while and now since we have better computational power, we can apply it more um, efficiently. So, but I think there is no doubt that um, unit testing uh, is the most uh, widespread technique that is used uh, by software developers. And yeah, it comes with a nice metric uh, as well, uh, it, which is uh, code coverage. And yeah, today, I, I want to focus on, on just on this. I'm not going to talk about like flaws and advantages of fast testing or formal verification, but I definitely want to talk about unit testing and its problems. So yeah, how it works in generally? <clears throat> in general, we have some code, and yeah, this is like artificial example just to to, to start. So we have some function, some that takes two integers and returns a sum of them. And for this function, what developer does? He writes a code like. The assertion is that the sum of 5 and 10 is more uh, greater than 0, which is absolutely correct. It's a valid statement, but it obviously it, it's not enough uh, because 5 multiplied by 10 also gr greater than 0. So if we run this test, then we see that uh, 0 tests has failed, uh, 1 test passed, and the cut coverage is 100%. So it, it definitely has uh, some... It might be misleading. The code coverage uh, metric might be misleading. And I see that uh, sometimes people are striving for a number, for this number, but the code quality is, uh, not the code quality, but the test quality is not as good. And there is no way to measure it, actually. There is no, just no way how to assert how good our tests. So here comes the mutation testing. So I will try to explain the algorithm behind it like very briefly um, if there is something like un completely unclear or like really confusing just feel free to like to, to interrupt me and ask I will elaborate uh, so yeah what we do like normally with mutation testing we have a program and we have a test suite 
We then execute this uh, test suite against that program, and every, if, if everything is good, if tests are passing, then we do the following. For the program, we take a mutant, we create a mutant out of the program. So we basically do some mutation um, on it. And it must be some um, semantic change. The program should be different. Then we take that mutated program and run test suite against it again. And then we check the result. If the result is failed, then we claim that uh, this mutant was killed. This is essentially a good thing. So if you introduce, if you run a test against mutated program, then the test should fail. If that's not the case, then we claim that mutant uh, is survived, and this is uh, kind of bad. So it means that something is wrong, either code or the test. So here again, our uh, initial example was the test and the program. Mm. So out of this program, we can generate uh, many mutants, but I will just show like, a couple of them. So first one is we replace A plus B with A multiplied by B, and the second one we replace A plus B with A minus B. Now, if we run the test against the first mutant, then it is still passes. So it, it yeah, mutant is survived, and it, it gives us a hint that something is wrong. However, the second mutant uh, is, well, was killed, and we are good to go here. So, based on this example, we can uh, derive few numbers. So, the total amount of mutants is two. One mutant was killed, one was survived. And mutation testing also comes with a metric called mutation score, and is calculated uh, by the formula uh, on the screen, like killed mutants, amount of killed mutants, divided by amount or like total amount of mutants, and multiplied by 100%. So in this specific case, the mutation score is 50%, and uh, it's not good. So again, you should not strive for 100%, because you probably will not reach it uh, anyway. But you can use it as just as a hint. So higher mutation score is better. Yeah, few facts, few things about uh, mutation testing. Oh, spoilers. Yeah, sorry. So it was <coughs> first proposed by Richard Lipton in uh, 1971. Uh, I think it was called uh, mutation analysis, so these are uh, the same, uh, kind of the same terms. So it was first uh, implemented by Timothy Butt in 1980s, and I think it was for Fortran, but uh, I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. There are several studies, like quite recent studies, that show that uh, certain mutate, uh, mutation testing systems for certain programs, they could help to find uh, bugs, like real faults, like quite high number of them, like 70 and uh, 90, actually 90, 94, 92 percent, like to, to be more precise. But uh, even despite this fact, mutation analysis was not, or it was not widely spread uh, because it has several problems as well as just everything. So the first problem, it generates like lots of data. For just 10 tests for a small program, you can end up with 100 mutants. And if you execute this, like, those 10 tests against those like, 100 uh, programs, then you end up like, to running the program like 1,000 times, in the worst case. Second one, yeah, it's time consuming. Because of this, like, the, the data, we have lots of data, we need to process it, to execute, it takes uh, quite a lot of time. Languages, they are not, not all the languages, I would say, are friendly for mutation testing, because um, it's, I think it's kind of easier for languages like Ruby or JavaScript because you have just like eval and, well, YOLO. So, but languages like C or C++, they are more, um, they're not as friendly because you essentially need to, to mutate the program, like to change the source code, like maybe AST, I don't know, then compile it, then link it together with everything and run and then assert. It's just quite slow, though I don't have uh, real numbers. Yeah, there is also a problem of a human test oracle. So let's say we uh, generated uh, lots of mutants and we cannot just say like whether are they, are they good or not. So we need somebody to actually look at, at those results and make the decision. Um, yeah, it also comes with um, another problem, but I will uh, tell a bit uh, about it uh, later. 
It's actually, and yeah, another one problem. I was surprised by that. I heard this like almost exactly this phrase, like "excuse me," but I write good tests. I I don't believe it, and it, for me it sounds like "excuse me," but my code is bug free, which is well not the case. My code is bug free, but yeah, not in general. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So the tool is called uh, Mal, not Mul. So um, it. With this tool, we are trying to, to solve some of those problems, but not all of them. And there are some things that uh, we do to actually uh, improve the performance and make it, uh, well, better in general. So we have kind of smart mutant selection. It means that, uh, I mean, it, it just helps us to, to, to decrease the amount of uh, mutants and amount of data we need to process. And it's very similar to uh, the second point. So we provide a means to control the data generation. So I will elaborate on it. Yes, it's uh, complicated as well a bit. Uh, so we also utilize the uh, runtime compilation and JIT. Uh, particularly, we use LLVM for that. And it means that we, we don't need to link something. We don't need to recompile things that much. And we completely eliminate I.O. Uh, bottleneck of I.O. in this case. So. Because of that, we are operating on the level of LLVM IR, which um, gives some nice tool things, but also comes with problems like you cannot, sometimes you cannot uh, like correspond the IR with the initial code. So they, well, they might be different, especially with C++ with all these templates in lining and uh, so on and so forth. And the great thing that it is language agnostic, given that all the languages are built on top of LLVM. So if something is built on top of LLVM, then it's likely that we can use it. Yeah, so it's time to elaborate a bit on um, how the system works. So this is the typical program. We have like several source files, uh, bitcode files, modules, whatnot. They have some functions and instructions. And if we just go and analyze the whole program as is, then we will find out like many, many, many mutants, many, many places where we can introduce the mutation. But it's not very efficient because, because most, like maybe not most, but big part of this code is like just unreachable for whatever reason. So the, bet, the better approach uh, would be as what we actually do. First, we try to find the actual tests thing that are, well, tests essentially. And based on this, those tests, we take the call sites, like uh, call functions. We are trying to build a uh, so-called um, call tree. And based on this call tree, it's like on this slide, you can see some modules, they are not needed. So we can just eliminate them completely. We don't need to compile them. We don't need to analyze them. Just, I don't know, consumes less memory and so on and so forth. So, yeah. With, uh, with this optimization, um, it is actually still experimental. It's a bit more tricky than I thought before, and it has some problems, but it is, it is definitely the way to go. So for example, on this slide, um, we took uh, some subset uh, of tests from um, LLVM itself, the target called IR tests, and we just took like two and a half hundreds of tests. And uh, before to actually to run this the whole system to pro to process it, we needed to look at like 400 modules, and it took roughly, yeah, 85 minutes. <clears throat> After this improvement, like cutting those like unused modules, we got like three times less modules, and almost uh, two. It works like almost two times faster. But again, it is experimental. It's not in uh, master trunk yet, but we're working on it. So here is the most um, complex program, like uh, closer to reality. And here we can see that um, on the left, the, the functions on the left, they are um, tests. And they go some way to like via some distance. And it has some distance. So for the same subset of tests, we took distance two. It produces the 100, uh, 1,000 and a half uh, mutants. And the real execution time that I measured on my machine took like 
about one hour, which is kind of acceptable. But for um, on the other hand, if we took the whole program, then the distance is 29 for, for this group of tests and number of mutants, it's, I think there is actually a bug. Um, it should be like orders of magnitude more, like maybe 200 thousands of um, mutants. And approximated, uh, approximation of like execution time is roughly 11 days, but it's very pessimistic. So in reality, it will take maybe seven days, six. So yeah, that still doesn't help. Um, yeah, and with, with this number, actually with this uh, mean to, to, to change the distance, to control the distance, uh, even if it takes one hour, you cannot probably use it on your machine like daily basis because, well, it's kind of a um, waste of time. But you still can use it as uh, like with the night, nightly bills, for example. And for, yeah, mutant control, okay. Yeah, there is another mean. Um, we can select some specific tests. So let's say you have like 200 tests, but you're interested in like one or like some group of tests. And uh, yeah, so basically you just like select one test and work with it with like even like uh, you reduce the amount of tests even further. And I didn't put numbers on slide, but the, the, I think the best case was uh, like 30, 40 seconds maybe for one test. And the worst case for a group of tests, which is I mean, 15 or 20 took like, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, which is like still reasonable. And it enables like really, really fast iterations. So I, I think this is like the, the best improvement that uh, we did so far, the best uh, kind of invention. Yeah, so a few words about the system design, um, how it works in general. So this is like in a nutshell. The program consumes as an input a config file, which is just a YAML, um, which is, doesn't matter. Um, what it contains is the list of bitcode files. Basically shows which modules, where to get modules to, to process. Mm -hmm. And it also like has um, this settings for distance and some cache and so on and so forth. So, but what the program spits out is the another config file and the SQLite file. So that another config file is um, reduced version of the first config file. So let's say that initially you provide a config with 400 uh, modules and you found out that you were like used only 100 of them. The next time you can run the program with that uh, reduced uh, config and you will not need to process like the 400 but rather 100. So it's kind of also improves the iterations. Yeah. We also don't provide any, so yeah, I mentioned the mutation score, but the program at this very moment, we do not provide any uh, like short report, like uh, your mutation score is something percent. Because again, as I said, I believe that we should not strive for numbers. We should just use them as a hint. And what we provide instead of this is the SQLite file, which contains information about just everything. And it has uh, the advantages. So. If I run something and I get results, I can treat them in any way I want. And I don't have to restart the program again, wait like hour or a week, and just, again, iterate faster. So this is, yeah, the program from the like, outside user perspective. So internally it contains, uh, consists on, from several, several modules. Uh, one is kind of core. It has just a driver that, uh, well, controls the basic system. It has a reporter and it will be uh, likely extended or replaced in the future. So instead of SQLite, you can report to the S, uh, like, uh, output or whatnot. One essential part actually is mutation operators. I didn't talk about them uh, before, so I will just briefly explain what's that. So every mutation tool, mutation testing tool, uh, they have some mutation operators. These are things that, like kind of rules that um, describe how you change your program. So it could be like replace plus with minus, like remove void function, or replace like a negate condition, for example, or I don't know, like skip the whole loop, for example, or like anything you can imagine. There are also some studies that do the mutation operators for, uh, for Java, I think, and they go in further and they change the class hierarchies. Like they inject some classes, remove, and so on, just to screw the system up even more. Yeah, the second part is also like straightforward. It's a tool chain. Um, maybe it's not the best name, but it, it just like JIT compiler from LLVM and the object cache. So when once we run the program once, we 
usually don't recompile the uh, biggest part of it with the next run. So it also improves the speed. Yeah, the most important, in my opinion, uh, the most important piece, the most important thing is the test framework. Basically, this is the vast one thing uh, now that is abstract uh, because it can be like Google Test, for example. If you want to run the tool again C++, then we have driver now and like all this infrastructure for Google Test. Um, it could be also like XC Test, for example, for Objective-C and uh, Swift, potentially. And just, I think, two or three days ago, we merged the initial support for, for Rust. It, it's not production ready. I mean, the whole tool is not production ready, but the Rust, uh, you can just take it and apply on any project, but we'll get there. Yeah, so kind of showcase. Initially, like a month ago, I wanted, when I was planning the slides and so on, I wanted to run the tool against the LLVM itself, and gather some results, dive into it, and find something, probably something interested, interesting. But the problem that I faced that uh, to actually assert the, to actually make sense out of those mutations, I need to know the domain of the tool very well, which is not the case, unfortunately. I don't know the, like, the most part of the LLVM, like uh, AP float and some other stuff. But the results are available online. Um, they might be cumbersome and unclear and maybe cryptic because um, I am in this context and I do understand everything there, but it's hard to, understand, like, it's hard to know for me what uh, people may need. So if you're into it and if you are interested, you may take a look and give some feedback. I would really appreciate it. Yeah, so again, the, some numbers for um, example that IR tests. <coughs> Yeah, you can see here the mutation score is 43%, which is quite low. And I actually saw, um, yeah, quite a few places that can be improved. But uh, again, I cannot just like do it easily and fast. I need to, to dive into this uh, matter, uh, which I didn't. And the same goes for ADT tests. The mutation score is a bit higher, uh, 66%, but it is still quite low, I would say. So what I did instead, I took the one part that is quite small and the code there is quite straightforward so even I couldn't can understand it. Uh, this, the triple test, I don't know if you're aware what the triple is but it doesn't really matter so just just some group of tests. And yeah the mutation score is quite high but I still wanted to see what's going on there and first thing I found is this kind of tests. So we have triple, we change the architecture and then we ask for well, then we assert that some, like in this case, like other architecture, like based on, on that initial architecture is like exactly as, uh, what we need. So what happened, what's happening behind the hood uh, under the method like get little endian arch variant, there is just like huge switch statement and that just maps things uh, together. And what we did, we basically started like removing switch cases like one by one. And we found that many uh, things, they just can be removed and the tests are still passing. So in this case, it just means that uh, we just need to add, like, to, to add more tests. Uh, yeah, slides, I think, switched, but okay. Yeah, so one could argue actually that this case can be found by code coverage. And this is like absolutely true. It will be there, I'm pretty sure. But the nice thing about the mutation testing in this case, that you get report like this one, and you clearly see like what was removed. Like let's say you remove this like this case, and you see like what what which tests were affected by this. So basically, what what tests you need to extend to improve to cover this case. And it took me like just the the whole flight from Berlin to Brussels, like one hour maybe, to improve this uh, a bit. And yeah, so I just like added, I covered all the cases, switch cases that like enum cases that were not covered. And yeah, I committed this, I think last night. So it's in trunk now. Uh, the second one is more interesting in my opinion. Um, so yeah, the test is like straightforward. We set some property of an object and then we assert that property is exactly like equals to what we just like used. But this test actually will pass if we just comment out this line. Just, just because the elf is default value. So there is no, I mean, yeah. So what mutation did uh, in this case, 
uh, set object format, the body of the method was kind of removed like completely. And the tests were still passing. So also what I learned uh, from this very specific example, so if you have situations like this, then it may s make sense as a developer to cover like two cases, at least two cases, and then it's very likely that you're good to go and you're not asserting develop default value. So again, I just like added like two lines and also committed it. As a check for, def as a check for default, initialize to not default in every test. Um, can you repeat, sorry? You, you add a test case which tests the default. Yes. And now you have a, you have claimed this as true. Yeah. And then in every, all the other test cases, you initialize to something which is not the default before you do the thing. Yeah, this is how it should work, but this is not <laughs> how it works. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, in this case, actually, you should have replaced the Mac O as first and the Yelp as second. Because uh, you still don't need the first uh, set object format. So I think it's a bit trickier. Um, okay, I cheated a bit. Okay, so the elf is not like default, like is like completely default. It based on uh, so it's default for Linux. On the arch that you run, yes. Yeah, it defaults uh, on Linux. It but it's different on uh, OS X, and even I run it on uh, OS X machine. The triple initialized to default value, like it, <coughs> when you give the empty empty string, it thinks that it's um, Linux machine. No idea why, but that's how it works. Don't try to understand the triple. No, I didn't. I didn't have this goal at all. Yeah, so another example, I, uh, it's not like the code exactly. Um, I think I found it in IR tests, but <coughs> I might be wrong. But the idea is that you have something, like if something, then we use slow version of an algorithm. Otherwise, we use fast version of, of the algorithm. And we have some tests. And if we basically introduce some mutation and we flip those branches, then the test still passes. And uh, again, one could argue that this is like fine, but I would say no because the only notion that something is slow and fast is like basically the name of a function, which is like not always the case. There might be just some comment, and it might be that it might be true as soon as like the developer like wrote this code in the first place. But like next year, somebody fixes a bug in the slow version, and it becomes not that slow, maybe and somebody else fixes back in the fast version and it became slow. So it, in this case, there should be some tests like to measure like performance, how slow, how fast. Maybe they are like not, maybe they are the same by performance and there is no need to write this code at all. Yeah. I think that's pretty much, this, pretty much it about the showcase I wanted to show. Um, so, as I said, the tool is still in progress, and we have some open questions. Um, the first one, the most important, I think, the most uh, kind of cumbersome is the integration. So since the tool is working on the level of LLVM bit code of IR, we need to get it somehow, some like from where, from somewhere. And to get the bit code for, for tests from LLVM, I needed to use CMake, then Ninja, then like bloody shell scripts with set, grep, and so on. So it's just not straightforward. Um, if you want to use it on your project like plug and play, it's not, we are not there yet. So this question is still open and we are trying to, to find the best way to, to do this, to, to improve the thing. So the, another kind of problem is UX. Um, it's still not clear, again, like how, how to do this like properly. So what, what we did initially, this SQLite file, and I wrote like bunch of Ruby code to generate this like pretty and uh, nice um, HTML, and it it really nice and it works uh, for me, but I don't know how it works for other people. And uh, again, the question is still open. We are trying to find a way to to make the system usable for for people. So another one. Um, I think it's not not the question anymore since we merged support for Rust. We were uh, talking about like which language we should try next because right now the system works uh, fine with C++. But I am afraid that the system, the current system design, can be biased by C++ itself. So we are wanted to take another language and to make the system kind of uh, flexible and well good. And there are obviously many, many, many unknowns. Um, so we don't use this tool in production yet. Uh, we don't have any users so far. So if you think that you're interested in it and you want to try, then I 
urge you to contact me and I would be more than happy to help like free and so on like uh, just for for sake of the tool yeah so uh, the project is available on github uh, it's open source it's like we're developing it um, well in an open way so if you have some questions or you want to get it, give it a try and I will gladly provide you support for this and just drop me a line at alex at lowlevelbits.org yeah and for some updates, uh, you can either follow the project on GitHub or follow me on Twitter, and I'm posting the updates on the pro process. Questions? Yeah, please. Do you find that these tests drive you to like over-specified tests, like as a, like testing your ad test will always return to five, as opposed to like testing the specification of the method versus the actual implementation? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I think yes, so I found one, uh, one test, um, it's quite lengthy, and it has some quite like another lengthy function, and there are maybe like 10 assertions in this test, and they all check whether the method returns true. So it doesn't check the, like the, it just checks like one, one basically one case with different inputs, but one case. So yeah, does it answer the question? Okay, thanks. Um, Please. What, what will happen if uh, after lengthy changes, the, uh, the code is mis misfunctional, it's uh, not compatible, doesn't work at all? Is so, it good or bad? <coughs> um, I think it, it, well, it is compilable because we control this stuff, so we try to make it compilable. Um, and we, we run all the tests and all the mutants, they are running in the, they run in uh, child process and we control that process so if program doesn't uh, work well it crashes then we know that it crashed <laughs> if it uh, if it happens to have like some inf uh, infinite loop then we also like we have timeout and we just like catch this as well yeah what, what will be the result is it good or bad there are some debates on this in my opinion it is uh, good i mean the program is broken then so we broke the the program so i think it's a good thing but the opinions are uh, where I, yeah, I, I don't know how. Let's go from left to right. Do you, do you do anything to try to not make mutations that make the color of the IR undefined itself? Like there are some bits in the IR where it says that if you do this, like the behavior is undefined. So do you introduce mutations that have that sort of behavior or do you try to not do that? So we we barely control the this aspect. We just, Again, you know, like make change and like YOLO. That's that's it. That's our approach. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah um, my question actually ties into the previous question. Insofar as I'm wondering, you know, say C plus plus or D or Rust, there's quite a bit of uh, stuff that's guaranteed on a type system that way. So where you could do an IAM mutation and see that the mutant survives, but where you know you couldn't have possibly made that mistake in a program. So we we are trying. Um, okay, uh, so the question is uh, whether yeah, we can. I mean, maybe it's a memory corruption. In that case, of course, it would crash and you would say, okay, the program is broken. Mm -hmm. but, uh, on the same level, you could think of mutations that you can't just type in the, in the source. And for an AST based tool, you also couldn't you know, make that mutation compile. Mm -hmm. If you just turn and add into a, a, a stuff on the IR level, it seems like you could uh, introduce many mutations that aren't necessarily. Yeah. yeah, so the question is whether we um, introduce some mutations on IR level that are not possible in the source code level. Is it correct? More, yeah. yeah, more or less. So um, we are trying to not do this, obviously. We don't have any guarantees on this, uh, but we are, well, we are trying to avoid some um, mutations. We have some like filters and some heuristics to not do this. So, for example, in case of C++, there are like lots of code is coming from the standard library, for example. It just was inlined, and it happened to be like the client code, basically. But if you mutate it, then it doesn't make any sense, because it's unlikely that you have a problem in, well, sure. in standard library. Like, that, that's not what I wanted to say, but you get it. Yeah. So, there was another question, I think. Yep, please. Yeah, so I got the impression that maybe for some projects, if you want to get a better mutation score, maybe you start adding an order of magnitude more tests. 
do you have any idea on um, how much pushback you would get in every time you want to make a change then for every line of code you change you have to change 10 times more lines of tests and it slows down your project because of that well then that's would that be a pushback in tests yeah, but I know the mutation score is good. It's good tests. Uh, so the again, is good, but the, then those tests that he added should never be changed because they should be right. And then if they're not, it's his fault. Yeah. I'm so just, I'm just wondering if there's like any experience by anyone in practice. Or real so I, d I don't have any experience in practice that can contradict or um, approve your statement, but it can be. Right. Yeah, okay. it can be. So yeah, please. Uh, the uh, execution or the selection of mutants. Is this uh, schedule kind of statically up front where you generate some threat, or do you do this as the testing progresses? So you could, for instance, look at are we reaching a threshold in, uh, in uh, mutation score, in which case there's no point in running much longer? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, no, that's a good idea, but uh, no, we do. So the, phases, like, the first phase is analysis. We gather all the information about the whole system all the mutation points, mutants, and so on, and then we start generating them and executing. So that might be actually, uh, yeah, that might be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I, as a comment, I could imagine that uh, uh, using a variety of, uh, of uh, mutation operators might, be, might, might find a lot. You know, we can go shallow yeah. and very, very broad. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be enough for uh, a program which is not well tested. Whereas if you have a really well tested program, you might, might need to go very narrow and test very obscure Things. Yeah, it that only works might if be the case. Changes are cumulative. If they're not, then you may be a cluster of many good changes at the end that you cut short because you, you weren't changing many at the beginning. So yes, so there are challenges. But yeah. Yeah, but there is like always the trade-off. Yeah, you can miss something, and yeah. Please. So what can I learn from a bad mutation score? Should I change my tests, or should I change the code that I'm testing? You should take a look and uh, make a decision then. Um, okay, so I yeah. have to understand the code. Exactly, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. That's the problem why I didn't manage to give nice uh, analysis based on LLVM itself, because I don't know many parts of it. So I could not understand what's wrong with test <laughs> or code. Right, that's yeah. it. No, we've, we have Let only two minutes to switch. Okay, one last uh, question. Sorry, okay, yeah. Uh, do, yeah. Do you have any plans for parallel execution or uh, stuff like that? Uh, so, practical practical? Not, not yet. Um, well, we do have plans, like, obviously, but um, they are, like, long-term, not something that we'll do soon. Yeah. So, thanks for questions. Thank